Hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Emily Kosick and I'm the Knowledge Manager at the Canadian Institute for Public Safety Research and Treatment. It's my pleasure to be hosting this event made possible by a partnership with the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Today, we conclude our series on research done for the post-traumatic stress injuries and public safety personnel catalyst grants. There are just a few housekeeping notes to go through before the, we begin the presentations. You are all in listen-only mode. This is to limit the ambient noise and feedback during the presentation. Today's session is being recorded and a copy will be sent out to everyone that is registered. Some organizations do block the GoToWebinar launch window. This means you may have to join by phone or you may be having, if you're having trouble hearing or viewing the session. Lastly, we ask that you use the questions box throughout the session to submit your questions for presenters. We'll make time to answer as many po as possible at the end of the session. I've also attached handouts for this session. In the control panel, you will be able to see them. Uh, these include the agenda for today and the English and French versions of the presenter's knowledge translation reports. In the chat box, I've put instructions if you uh, need assistance in downloading the handouts. So uh, let's move on to our first project for today. And that is mental ill health and firefighters deployed into the Fort McMurray fire. Uh, it is going to be presented by Jean-Michel Garneau from the University of Alberta, and hopefully I didn't mess up your name too much, Jean-Michel. Mm -hmm. And I'm passing presenter control to you. All right, so hello everybody. I'm uh, Jean-Michel, and I'm presenting about uh, mental ill health in uh, firefighters that uh, were at the Fort McMurray fire. Can everybody see the presentation well? I suspect you can. All right, so what is the Fort McMurray fire? Well, I'm sure everybody knows a little bit about it. It's the a rather large fire that happened in uh, 2016, started in May uh, within the city. And um, it went on uh, to uh, the end of July and continued burning actually uh, for a whole year later on. Uh, it caused the evacuation of all 88,000 citizens from the city of Fort McMurray and thousands more from surrounding oil sands operations and towns. Um, it destroyed 3,000 buildings or more and uh, one and a half million acres of forest. Some 3,000 firefighters from all over Alberta were deployed there at one point or another. So it's the study we're talking about today is part of a much bigger study, so, uh, a two-phase study. Uh, the first phase of this study was uh, started in, uh, immediately after the fire in 2016, where a, a research team from here uh, deployed quickly to Fort McMurray and other areas to recruit firefighters that had been there. Um, we collected uh, exposure data and a questionnaire and uh, PFTs and other things, uh, mental health uh, questions, etc. So that first phase uh, gave us 354 firefighters. And then we decided to expand the study and uh, launch the second phase. Uh, we used a recognition list to uh, contact and invite firefighters to participate to the study. The recognition list uh, was uh, a list so provided uh, to the government and by the government um, to thank all the firefighters that had been there. And so we used that list to contact more people. And in the second phase, we gained uh, 880 firefighters. There was a baseline that everybody completed and two follow-ups after that. Um, all of those questionnaires had some mental health questions. The last follow-up had the PCL5 in it. Here's a little bit of a breakdown of how it all went. Um, First, we had the fire. Phase one, we recruited some 354. Phase two, we recruited another 880, and then we were at 1234. Then in October 2018 and 2019, the second follow-up was launched, and in between uh, those dates uh, was uh, the first follow-up. People completing the second follow-up, uh, there were about 1,000 of those people. So the objectives of uh, this part of uh, this big study. So the first objective was to 
um, put the or invite firefighters to go through uh, structured clinical interviews using the SCID-5 to uh, characterize mental ill health. And in the SCID-5, we only narrowed it down to these disorders, PTSD, depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, and substance use disorder. And we wanted to be able to characterize these, only these disorders. And then following the SCID-5, the participants that were invited to, uh, to participate in this part of the study uh, also completed the childhood experiences questionnaire. Uh, so that we could see if these relate to uh, the mental ill health reported or relate to not having mental ill health uh, as well. So um, to do this, uh, we uh, used uh, stratified random sampling and identified uh, firefighters uh, to invite for the interview. We couldn't invite the whole thousand. It would have taken too long. Uh, so the first group that was invited was uh, everybody that scored 12 or more on the anxiety, uh, on the HADS anxiety or HADS depression. Uh, and uh, also everybody that scored 28 or more on the PCL5 uh, PTSD screening questionnaire. Um, we also invited 30% of those that had scored between eight and 11 on the HADS and 10% of those that scored less than 28 on the PCL5 and seven on the HADS. So these participants were invited to uh, to part well to for the structural uh, clinical interviews, and um, a nurse that had experience in a psychiatric setting was used for these interviews, and she traveled all over Alberta uh, meeting with these people. She was trained beforehand by Dr. Cherry, um, occupational uh, psychologist and uh, a psychiatrist from the U of C. So. The statistical methods for study A, well, uh, first we wanted to estimate the prevalence of PTSD and other uh, the other three mental uh, ill health aspects from the questionnaire. Um, and to do that, uh, we had to uh, account for the weight or, or the, the probability of being selected. So we computed uh, probability of selection weights, as it were, using a logistic regression. And we selection as the outcome in that regression and uh, the scores on PCL5 has anxiety and has depression as the uh, predictive variables and uh, computed a probability of selection and the inverse of that became the probability weight with which we uh, uh, made the corrections for the prevalence estimates and then the second part of the study we used the answers to the SICA questionnaire, the Childhood Experiences questionnaire, um, and related those to the uh, results from the SCID-5. And uh, so we did this in two parts. The first part was to only look at those that had a diagnosis. And uh, we, we used a multi-level, uh, multinomial regression to do that. So we put them all in a model and then looked at how uh, the SICA questionnaire or results from the SICA related to those uh, diagnoses and then the second part was to put everybody including those that didn't have a diagnosis into a similar model and tested the same the same relations so here's the results for study a um, we identified 282 firefighters from the stratified random sampling and 192 uh, 192 of those completed the skid 5 questionnaire uh, 131 in person and uh, 61 by telephone. Uh, here on the right side, we can see uh, the results from that from those 192, and we found uh, 78 of them uh, to be diagnosed with uh, PTSD uh, based on the SCID-5, and that was the the highest proportion of all the disorders we see there. Uh, following that, we uh, estimated prevalence in the entire population of 1,000, if you remember the flow chart earlier. So to do that, I, I used the probability weights and then corrected for the selection bias we had. And, and uh, it gave us an uh, estimated prevalence in that population of 21.4%. Uh, so we, we were estimating that uh, of the 1,000 firefighters that went to, uh, that, that were in our study that were in Fort McMurray, some 21.4% of them would be diagnosed with PTSD. It still remained as the largest uh, uh, diagnosis here, as you can see in the table. And this study is published now. You can look at 
further details. I think it's open access also, so anybody can look at it. So steady B, now here we see that we had only 888 of the 800, oh, sorry, 188 of the 192 uh, that completed the CICA. So we lost four there, um, no, that's okay. And uh, we saw 66% of, of uh, those people completing the CICA had some diagnosis. And so as I explained before, the first aim was to look at the relation of the CICA uh, with the diagnoses. So here's a uh, both a univariate and multivariate analysis of that. So at the top here we see the ones that uh, were found to be uh, significantly related to a diagnosis was uh, antipathy of the mother in a univariate model, that's important, and uh, uh, sexual abuse. And a uh, factor that was protective against uh, a diagnosis was having a confidant of the same age, and we can see that here for uh, uh, depression disorder and PTSD. Uh, sexual abuse was significantly predicting uh, anxiety disorder and uh, depression and a substance abuse disorder. Now, when we put them together in a multivariate model, we found that the ones that remain significant were sexual abuse, uh, still for anxiety disorder as a predictor of it, and uh, substance use uh, disorder, uh, but also that uh, having a childhood confidant or a confidant of the same age uh, was still significantly protective against uh, a depression disorder, uh, PTSD. So that was an interesting finding, but that was just of those people with a diagnosis. Now, when we looked at everybody else, altogether, the diagnoses and the 34% of those that didn't have a diagnosis, and here's just the final uh, multivariate model. We found that um, childhood, for childhood experiences, uh, father uh, antipathy was uh, still significant with, uh, I can't see the right side here. Okay, substance use disorder, I think, yes. And uh, PTSD and anxiety disorder. Uh, physical punishment of the father was a significant predictor of PTSD and of the mother was a significant predictor of substance use disorder. A childhood confidant of the same age was uh, again protective against anxiety disorder, depression, and PTSD. Uh, while a mental ill health before the fire uh, was uh, a significant predictor of uh, depression disorder and uh, one uh, serious life event in the months before the skid five was also associated to be a, a significant predictor of uh, depression ptsd and substance use disorder uh, being a woman was uh, a predictor of anxiety disorder so the one i skipped there was uh, exposure because i thought that was an interesting one so exposure means exposure to uh, respirable dust and that was measured uh, estimated for all the firefighters that participated in our study. So basically it's a way of saying how intense the fire would have been where you were in the city of Fort McMurray. And we see that those most, or in, in the most uh, intense parts of the city, fighting the most intense fires, were at higher risk of uh, developing, or not developing, being diagnosed with PTSD. This study is also published and you can access it here. I'm not sure if it's open access so actually. So in conclusion, to make uh, occupational mental health provisions for firefighters effective in mitigating effects of work-related trauma, it's important to consider the impacts of uh, childhood experiences. Uh, uh, this is a recommendation that's been found in other publications and, it, and there's a, a sort of framework called trauma-informed care and I think this would fit well for this population of firefighters. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I am gonna go ahead and just uh, turn over sharing control to our next presenter. Uh, our next presenters are, uh, the study is Suicide Among Public Safety Personnel Compared to the General Population in Ontario, a Case Control Study. It is being presented by Dr. Simon Hatcher, Vice Chair of Research, Department of Psychiatry at the University of Ottawa, and his knowledge user, who you'll see on the screen, Zach Cantor. So if you guys want to go ahead Sorry? and okay. present, yeah, you can go ahead and 
I can see your screen, so you're good there. If you, I don't know if you want to use your video or not. So. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Can yeah, everyone hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. So thanks for the introduction. My name is Zach Hanter. I'm going to be presenting uh, on behalf of Dr. Simon Hatcher as well. Uh, we're presenting suicide among public safety personnel compared to the general population in Ontario, a case control study. So I'm a research assistant with uh, Dr. Hatcher in his lab. I'm also a primary care paramedic with the city of Ottawa, so I'm the knowledge user. And Dr. Hatcher is a full professor and vice chair in the Department of Psychiatry at the uh, University of Ottawa. Um, this is our contact information. If anyone's looking to get in touch, uh, there's sort of a point where we're asking for a little bit of help. Uh, so this is um, the email address as well as the link to our website if you're looking for. Obviously, we're not working in a silo on this one. So we have doctors Mark Senor and Ayal Schaefer, both psychiatrists at the Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto, helping us out. The amazing Nicole Edgar is running the study locally, uh, as well as Ravi is here as our research assistant. And obviously, the study has been approved. Uh, through the REB and no one has any conflicts to declare. So in terms of the background, we know suicide is the ninth leading cause of death in Canada and public safety personnel are at an increased risk of dying by suicide. And when I say public safety personnel, I'm referring to fire, police, both municipal, provincial and federal. Uh, I'm referring to paramedics, corrections officers, as well as the dispatchers at those respective services. And so we also know that these public safety personnel are at an increased risk of developing mental health disorders, uh, self-harm and suicidal ideation and attempts compared to the general population, almost four times that. And uh, that's mostly due to sort of uh, the work we do. Um, but with police, it's also access to weapons that they have on their person. And so we know also that previously reported mental health disorders are also prevalent in about 90% of all suicides, which given the previous stats is quite concerning for this population. So as a result of that, in 2019, the Office of the Chief Coroner of Ontario, uh, they recommended the recording and the reporting of first responder suicides, and that can help sort of identify clusters and prevent, uh, or, I'm sorry, direct prevention initiatives. Now, Canada-wide, there's limited research available on Canadian uh, public safety personnel, especially paramedics and firefighters. Most of the research is directed uh, towards police. But Dr. Carlton and colleagues, he, they conducted a survey of suicidal ideation plans and attempts among public safety personnel. And uh, they sort of found that in the past year, uh, or the lifetime suicidal ideation was 10 and call it 28% respectively. Uh, same with the past year plan or lifetime plans, about 4% and 13%. And the suicide attempts in the past year or lifetime attempts, uh, also quite low, but still higher than the general population. Um, and the Ottawa Paramedic Service is sort of an internal study, which is just under review, and their data suggests similar numbers. If we look at our American counterparts in 2012, they revealed that between 20 and 25% of volunteer firefighters considered suicide, and that's compared to one eighth of the general population. So a huge difference there. Now, despite these risks, the mental health service utilization is very low amongst uh, first responders, public safety personnel, and there's a lot of reasons, but mostly unknown. Uh, and so in line with that, there's limited research focusing on the mental health utilization of those who die by suicide. Now, previously, the Teamer, Tima Contra Memorial Trust uh, collected data, uh, and they found that about 60 odd um, suicides in Ontario and 200 across Canada uh, from 2014 to 2018. Uh, we think though that this, that this data is likely underreported. Um, and so really a critical component of suicide prevention is the access to the appropriate, um, sorry, just one second here, to appropriate mental health services, yet there's little research examining the utilization amongst our public safety personnel. So really, to summarize, there's a need to better characterize the health service use and the suicides of public safety personnel in Ontario. There we go. So really, the impact is that we know that deaths by suicide are a major public health crisis. We know that suicide deaths are underreported and are often classified as undetermined or accidental, so we don't actually know if they're a suicide. And so this is all to say that there's very little information on uh, public safety personnel suicide despite evidence that suggests they're a higher risk of suicide than the general population. So the objectives of the study is thus to, number one, describe the suicide deaths among the public safety personnel in Ontario, uh, see if there's any differences or characteristics between that group and the general population, um, 
examine the differences in health service use within the past two years leading up to their death, as well as ex examining differences in the media reporting. There's some sort of uh, studies have suggested that the media reports on these suicides a little bit differently. Um, so in order to do it, we're undertaking a case control study who, of public safety personnel who died by suicide in Ontario from January 1st, 2014 to December 31st, 2018. Uh, we're going to be comparing that to a match sample uh, who also died by suicide in the same period. Uh, all the coroner records will be reviewed at the office of the chief coroner in Vaughan, Ontario by the study staff. And like I mentioned before, police, so that's going to be our municipal police, provincial, so Ontario Provincial Police, as well as the RCMP if they're posted in Ontario by our paramedics, correctional services, and dispatchers of the respective services. Um, we're going to examine the print and online articles for 10 major newspapers and websites in Ontario. Uh, there's also a list from the Team of Contour Memorial Trust. Uh, we've approached some provincial associations, the union leaders or other community-based organizations, as well as the peer support teams within some of these organizations, uh, the First Responder Mental Health Network Collaboration here in Ottawa, and then there's been some personal referrals uh, with the study team. Um, like I mentioned, it's gonna be a case control from the general population, and they're gonna be matched by age, ideally exact age, but no more than plus or minus two years, uh, the year of death, the region in Ontario, uh, as well as the employment status, if that's possible. So inclusion criteria, we want to know that the last known address was in the province of Ontario, uh, confirmed suicide within January 1st to 2014 and December 31st, 2018. And uh, for the intervention, they have to be an active member, uh, working or on sick leave from one of the sort of mentioned organizations. Uh, and exclusion-wise, uh, they can no longer, sorry, must not be retired or no longer employed. Uh, and then for the control, uh, they must at no point have ever been a member of any of these organizations. And same thing, must not be unemployed or retired at the time of their death. So to date, we sort of have identified 34 public safety personnel suicides from 2014 to 2018 in Ontario. All of them are male with an average age of just under 45 years old. The vast majority uh, are police, six are paramedics, and seven are fire. Now, this is sort of where we're crowdsourcing a little bit. We're unclear if this is everyone. Uh, so if you are aware of any, please let us know. Um, I put our contact info at the beginning, and there's another slide at the end. Uh, so please share those. Um, and to date, of those, 34, of those 34, sorry, we've completed data on nine of them with one screen failure, and that's of uh, last week or so. So of the nine we found, 100% are male. We have an average age of 41 years old with a range of 29 to 52. Keep in mind, these are just descriptive stats at this point. Uh, four of the nine um, have resided in an urban area. Uh, most are married. We have one single and one who's divorced and separated. Uh, most seem to have children. Uh, and as is no surprise, 89% uh, are police. And we have an average years of service of just under 14 years with a range of six months to 24 years. So that's sort of the, the nine we found. Um, we've sort of noticed that also the presence of at least one psychiatric disorder has been present in about 56% of the time. Same with at least one medical disorder. Uh, this is quite interesting that there's been a presence of a documented adverse life event, and I'll talk about those in a second, as well as a documented previous history of a suicide attempt. Uh, and so this is sort of the psychiatric disorders that we found. Now, this is a non-inclusive list, so it's possible that um, someone could have depression and anxiety and PTSD. Uh, but these are sort of the main ones that we've come across. Uh, and in terms of a medical condition, these are sort of the ones we're noticing as well. Once again, not mutually exclusive. So uh, the big ones being uh, chronic pain, cardiac sleep disturbances, as well as some other minor ones, such as uh, a rash or um like a fungal infection uh, and then sort of we've noticed the adverse life events so the two big ones seem to be uh acute job stress at work as well as a relationship break breakup and that's either uh, a pending relationship breakup or something that's recently uh, happened and so also we've noticed uh, a wide a little bit of a range of the suicide method so of the six firearm deaths so 67 percent uh, four were used with a service-issued weapon, uh, and likely the fifth was. It just wasn't categorized as such. And that's really interesting if we compare it to the general population, where we know that the national firearm death is about for suicide is about 16%. Um, and we're seeing here sort of an even distribution of deaths at home, deaths at work, 
death in a car or sort of death outdoors. Uh, just over half the time, there's been a suicide note present. Uh, two hasn't been documented as such. Uh, and interestingly, uh, drugs or alcohol has only been present uh, in one of these cases as well. And so really, uh, our next steps, just like everyone else, COVID has definitely impacted uh, our study. And so really, we haven't been able to be in the corner. They've shut down due to lockdown. So that's probably the next big step is completing that data abstraction once they open up again. Uh, at this point, it's not clear when that'll be. Uh, and then in line with that, complete the data abstraction for the controls and probably initiate a provincial or national registry of PSP suicides. So like I mentioned, if anyone has any further questions or any idea uh, or can identify any possible cases, please uh, don't be shy. Please send Dr. Hatcher an email. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen. Thank you so much for your presentation, Zach. All right, so I am going to give over share and control to the next presenter, so she can have a moment to set up. And I will introduce her right now. So the next project is understanding the impact of prison work on the mental health of correction officers employed by Correctional Services Canada, uh, beginning a longitudinal study. Uh, our presenter today is Dr. Rosemary Richardelli. She's a professor of sociology at Memorial University in, in Newfoundland. And hopefully you got the sharing control there. <laughs> I, I think I have it now. Okay. So thank you for having me today. Um, I'm talking about understanding the impact of prison work on the mental health of correctional officers employed by Correctional Service Canada. And this is starting a longitudinal study that is now well on its way as um, the CIHR funding had made it possible to start and to pilot the project with the support of... Um... Can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect with the support of uh, Correctional Service Canada and Yuko Saxon. And then we've taken, um, we, we were fortunate enough to get a team grant that further supports this work. So this project is slightly more developed than just it would have been with the Catalyst. So just disclosure, disclosures first, um, I guess the, the main one is this research is supported by CIHR. It's also supported by CSC, the Union of Safety and Justice Employees, Yuko Saxon, which is the Union of Canadian Correctional Officers and Memorial University. So the research content. We know that increased public and scholarly attention has been paid to post-traumatic stress injuries among public safety personnel, but less is focused on the work-related PTSIs among correctional staff themselves. We know that correctional officers are now recognized as first responders. Um, they are first responders in a confined space and they're responsible for the safety and security of a population that is legally held um, in custody. Correctional officers must constantly negotiate their risk potential. They're um, physically at risk, psychologically, socially, and personally at risk of, of different types of harm. And it's because of their conditions of work that they're at, at risk of harm. So there's a longstanding link between occupational exposures of all types and employee mental health and well-being. And really what this study is intending to do is to unpack that link. So when we look back at, this is um, from Carlton and Al's AX1 uh, prevalence study. If we look here quickly, we see that correctional workers screen positive for major mental disorders quite frequently. You know, with PTSD at 29.1, major depressive at 31.1. But this is a mixed sample of provincial and ter territorial correctional officers and doesn't strat stratify by job. Here we see if we look at um, the experiences of persons working within CSC, if we look at operational institution, we see again these high rates of mental disorders, but again we're not stratifying by occupation type. So in the longitudinal study, um, we partnered with CSC and we launched in spring of 2018 when the National Training Academy relocated to Kingston, Ontario. We hope this is a five to 10 year project. We have an MOU with CSC that also supports the work. And we get data from multiple sources. We have sociological qualitative interviews, psychological assessments, self-report surveys, and perhaps in the future biometrics. We identify risk factors for poor mental health that extend beyond personal factors. We recognize the wraparound effects of work and life. And rather than spending time figuring out if what's happening in your personal life is impacting work or work impacting personal, we know that they're all interconnected and mixed because prison work in itself, prison is a society in itself and that will have a multitude of impacts. We hope to develop infrastructure and evidence to support all correctional officers and correctional staff. We also include in the study program evaluation of a mental health training intervention. I'll speak about that a little bit. And we provide training recommendations and, consider, and recommendations and considerations during as part of the study. 
So the longitudinal study itself, um, this is my shoulder from when I was in uniform, but the study has four subprojects and spans both official languages. The first is clinical and contextual surveys. The second is clinical assessments, non-diagnostic. The third is the qualitative interviews. And subproject four is data, uh, future data synthesis, which I'll show you, but I won't speak too much of today. Also, because this is an interdisciplinary project and it requires people with a, a multitude of skill sets and from different disciplines in order to enact each subproject. So in subproject one, the surveys, um, with the Catalyst grant, we did 157 baseline surveys. These are psych psychological screening tools to unpack the mental health status of correctional officer recruits, because we know that persons with employment tenure have um, score tend to score sort of higher for uh, mental health disorders or screen positive more often for mental health disorders. We have a post-training survey. Um, we didn't have a huge response rate at the time, it was 45 individuals, but it was criminological and sociological scales and we're measuring things like stress, organizational commitment, training experiences, orientations toward the job. All of these factors inform and inform a person's well-being. We also add an evaluation of a mental health, a mental health component of the training. Then we do a year one survey. So we have our baseline survey, our post-training survey. Then we do a year one survey, which um, had only received 27 respondents, one data collection pause. And here again, in the year one survey, we would do criminological and sociological scales measuring stress. Um, we also introduced COVID scales more recently. We have a COVID pause. So from last year, when COVID hit around March, April, we stopped collecting data and we actually just restarted again January 1st of 2021. So this is sort of like what, what the data was, what was happening with the data when COVID hit. So um, post COVID, we introduced COVID scales and basically in year two, we'll reflect the baseline, year three reflects um, year one, and we keep alternating back and forth between sort of like the criminological sociological measures and the psychological screening measures to try to provide like a wholesome picture of what's going on. So if we look a little bit at um, our results, we see generally that, you know, um, the recruits are a very diverse group. Um, you know, they're pretty equal, male and female. We have a, a variety of individuals across different ages and languages. And we also see that many have prior experience in public safety related careers. If we look at how they scored on um, how they screened in terms of uh, mental disorders, we see that individuals did have some positive screens, but they were relatively low. And we have here the suicide ideation screens as well, where we see it's really low screening. So if we look back to that comparison with kind of the survey findings uh, uh, more with people with occupational tenure, we're finding it a very different picture than what we see when we look at baseline screening. So our next component of the study, subproject two, is a structured diagnostic assessment. We use the mini international neuropsychiatric interview, the mini. These are established questionnaires used that assess potentially tra psychologically traumatic events, uh, exposure, anxiety, etc., a variety of different symptoms. They follow the structure of the mini, and it's an evidence-based consistent model that will allow us to establish legally defendable psychological, psychological diagnosis related to correctional officer recruits, correctional officers employment tasks consistent with the DSM-5 diagnostic criteria, but it's non-diagnostic. It just gives you screening so you can see. So as of January 1st, 2020, um, we have done, because we had the COVID pause again, we have done 130 baseline minis and 14 follow-ups. And our results here are pretty consistent with what we saw in the, um, the online survey. And again, suggest that individuals enter the, the correctional workforce with um, low rates of active mental disorders, and maybe they have more lifetime or, or um, historical, but generally everyone's got a pretty good bill of health. The third subproject is qualitative interviews. Um, these are in-depth semi-structured interviews. They're guided by a central list of 30 questions and they follow the conversational path as put forth by the interviewee. Um, it's emergent theme analysis that we use to draw up the themes. So we look for consistencies across experiences. Um, although an N equals one might be interesting, it's not, a, it's not consistent across experiences. And in that context, um, we wanna see the general themes that are emerging across all participants. Pre-COVID, um, baseline interviews were conducted largely in person at the training academy. During COVID, um, now that we restart as of January 1st, we're conducting them all by phone. So the impact is really on recruitment um, in that context. And post-COVID, whatever that is, we don't know if baseline interviews will be by phone or in person again.
Follow-up interviews occur annually. They're conducted by phone, particularly during COVID or in person post-COVID. And some of those initial follow-ups that were done before our pause were conducted um, were conducted in person. So unless otherwise requested, participants are interviewed during work hours, but we give them all an option. So baseline interviews, we did 354. Um, and the year one follow-ups, we had done 58 before we paused in March with the January 2020 restart. So select findings here. CSC introduced advanced mental strength. It was first implemented in May of 2018 uh, 18 within the Correctional Training Program. So in CTP, recruits undergo 14 hours, seven two-hour sessions of AM strength training. And these include like an introduction, the basics of psychoeducation, current response tendencies, skill development across the zones that we tend to recognize from R2MR, and program recap and future planning. The core of AM strength is participants using the skills learned and applying them into day-to-day -day practice and training their minds. So I'm just going to read a quote from the program there. And it's AM strength training will not by itself make you mentally fit by just going along and listening. AM strength training simply provides you with the tools, the mental gym equipment. Um, sorry, I'm sure you guys can see that. Um, AM strength training simply provides you with the tools, the mental gym equipment, an explanation of how to do the training exercises, and a personal training plan for you to implement. You need to be actively involved and take these tools that are provided within the AM strength training program and train your brain to build your mental skills. So what is basically the idea is unless you engage the program, just going through the program won't be sufficient. So when we did um, in the first 49 okay. interviews, we did correctional officer recruits. Can you guys hear me okay, given I'm getting notification that um, Maybe my internet you just want to turn is your okay? Video off. If you just want to turn your video off, Rose, we are getting a little bit on unstable sound. Okay. Okay, so select findings. Um, asked about, we. this is interviews with the first 49 correctional officer recruits. We asked about their views of AM strength training and the use of the skills taught. And the examples here were questions were like, have you done a pulse check since learning it? Do you have a plan if you were to enter the amber zone? So this is 14 referred to training positively. 13 felt perhaps it would be good for others, but not for them. A seven felt AM strength was recap rather than skills. And six felt AM strength provided new tools for mental health awareness. So it was received quite well in, for the most part. Participants felt mental health training was exceptionally important. AM strength at the conceptual program was really positively viewed. The idea, the idea was that people want mental health training in CTP during their training, and that was very clear. The challenge was that skills taught only selectively used outside the cl classroom. Some did pulse check outside the classroom. For example, we only had one participant who actually made a zone plan, which is a key component of the um, AM strength training. So subproject four, this is the future synthesis and prediction. There are three explicit data types. We have quantitative surveys, minis, uh, the mini results, and the qualitative interview. And we have contextual data as well. And, we're, and the plan is to use machine learning, so the study of computer algorithm, um, to actually understand and uh, understand and unpack more of the nuance within the data. This is done by an engineer, a biomedical engineer. I don't fully understand the full nuance on, of it, but I look forward to the outputs. So ways forward and takeaway points, we're building a knowledge translation plan that will move knowledge produced throughout CSC to help inform practices. And CSC is invested in this through a micro mission where we're actually finding ways to take the knowledge that we produce in the longitudinal study and funnel it back to all branches, um, all relevant branches within the organization to actually impact policy and change and practice. Um, of course, the question is, is the recruit population consistent with that of the general CX, correctional officer, PW, primary workers who are correctional officers working in women's institution? And we're, we're not sure. We know that the mental health of recruits reveal significantly lower prevalence of mental health disorders and ideation than that found in data among more tenured employees. So one of the questions that we look at in the studies is, is experience with a mental disorder helpful for correctional work? Do employees enter with more skills to overcome the symptoms tied to mental health disorders if they actually have experience with it? Um, also part of the study included creating protocols to help guide participants to resources for intervention when they are screening positive or for managing ideation. So we're supporting the participation in the study for all the CXs and PWs, which is an essential. So the PSP take home message to date, we have seen substantial advances through improving mental health support. 
among PSP, including for those in correctional services. We have available evidence that suggests correctional employees need more supports. Um, there's a huge increase in discussion over the past five years, increased research activity like the longitudinal study, increasing calls from leaders, members, academics for evidence-based supports. Um, and you know, pending increases in frontline supports. And I think the the long the, the context of this longitudinal study is recognizing that a career in corrections is a marathon, and we need everyone to act accordingly and intentionally, and demand and support evidence-based improvements in order to move forward. So thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Richardelli. Uh, probably once you stop sharing your slides and we're doing questions, you'll be able to turn your video on. Sometimes I think the slides take up a lot of the internet as well. So uh, I do welcome everybody who hasn't submitted questions to go ahead and submit questions now. If you have any, uh, just be kind enough to identify the project for me. Uh, I am going to start with a question for the uh, project number one. Um, can you go into a little bit more detail about the type of pre-existing trauma that was most related to mental health disorders seen after the fire? So I guess what they're asking is, was there a specific type of childhood trauma you saw in that study B? that was more linked to uh, later mental yeah. health? Yeah, uh, well, there's two things going on that I may not have been clear uh, about. We also uh, looked at everything that we got from Alberta Health, you know, if they had any diagnosis, diagnostic claims made by physicians and whatnot. Uh, so that's one thing we looked at. Uh, I mean, it's not, a, it's not reported in this PowerPoint very much, but if you read the papers, it's there. Uh, I think the one that the main one was uh, in our last models. If you're talking about the Sika, uh, I actually have the paper right here so I can tell you which was common. <laughs> yeah, so I, I had reported things about. Um, I think from memory it was uh, neglect from the mother or father, something like that, had been uh, an important factor coming up often. Um, and uh, the other part that I sort of went too quickly over was that we did ask about if they had had some uh, event in their lives. And now that's also in that final model I showed you. So that would have been... Uh, some things they considered traumatic, like a divorce or someone dying, because uh, that could have been affected uh, the results of the SCID-5. So that's something else we did uh, include in the in the multivariate models, yes. But I think it was antipathy the most, uh, imp well, not important, but uh, the, the one of the factors that came up the most often. Okay, perfect. Um, just so the audience knows, we do have the study from session uh, that he mentioned in session A. It is already on the SIPSRA website, and I will hunt down the reference for number two and make sure it's under our publications as well, so you guys can always click through there to easily find it. Um, so for group number two, uh, so Zach, um, why would you not want to include people who have retired from the service when you're looking for service at, the first, at suicides? Uh, Simon, do you want to field that one? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Okay, um, so the reason is it's really hard to define. Um, because I, I actually think it's a separate study. Because um, what you would get would be people who maybe spent five years as a firefighter in their 20s who die of suicide in their 60s. That, for instance, um, it's not necessarily people who spent a lifetime as a first responder. Um, so it's actually quite hard to define what you know, a career in, in the, as a first responder is. Um, but I think, actually think it's a separate study. That, that, that the answer is, is it's really hard to define who's, who's a retired first responder consistently. Okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, Rose, um, the question for you is, now that you've started your collection again, and it's probably too early, but um, do you, are you seeing just in the preliminary data you're getting now that you're back at it, are you seeing any differences in those follow-ups compared to the pre-COVID follow-ups? Oh, I think you're muted. 
sorry about that. Um, it's a little bit premature to really start speaking to any types of difference. We know that COVID has caused a lot of strain within the institutions, and it's also changed the dynamics of the academy due to COVID, et cetera. And, um, so it's, we, we will definitely, there are, there are definitely um, going to be differences in the pre versus current the pre-COVID versus current sample, but it's a bit premature to speak too much about it. We've only started it up again. It, it's been almost two months. Um, by the time we started interviewing, it was mid-January and getting the survey going and everything else. So it's a lot of data. It's a lot of analysis and it would be, it would, it would be, I, I, I don't want to speculate. Okay, perfect. All right, uh, Jean-Michel, I've got another question for you. So it seems like sexual abuse is the only factor that reached a level of significance in the model. How did you decide whether factors were important in your, in your uh, analysis? Yeah, if, if you, uh, I, I don't know if you can still see it, but uh, yeah, uh, sexual can... abuse came up in, uh, in our univariate analysis along with the uh, mother's antipathy, uh, but then that in the multivariate uh, analysis that disappeared and only sexual abuse remained. I mean, uh, we just kept things that were under 0.05. In the methods part of the paper, you'll see that. Uh, we didn't uh, uh, discriminate ourselves. I mean, we just let the data do its thing. Yes. Okay. That was in the, the group of 124, just, uh, just as a reminder, not the whole group. That was in the group of those with, uh, with at least one diagnosis. Okay. All right, so Zach, next question is for you. Can you discuss the challenges in getting accurate information on suicide cases and how the information might lead to prevention? Uh, I can definitely chat about the first part, so some of the challenges around the data collection. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has seen corner records, but a, a lot of the time, a lot of the data is, is missing or sort of you can't confirm that it's there. And even if you try and sort of get at it in the backdoor way, it's not necessarily captured. So a lot of the stuff, it's just a missing by virtue of what's there, especially if, um, especially true when we sort of go back for the two years and try and see if there's been any healthcare utilization. Uh, it's hard to sort of amalgamate across all those different database, databases and sort of see over there. Uh, so that's part one. I think uh, Dr. Hatcher can probably tackle part two better than I would. So, um, yeah, it's, so it's a one problem, as you gather, is COVID. Um, the Ontario Coroner's Office has been closed for much like the last year. So that's why we've only been able to get data on nine. When you get data, as Zach said, the data is collected inconsistently. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do on a broader scale is to have conversations with the coroners about collecting more consistent data and especially having some uh, occupational record on coroner's data, not, not just in Ontario, but across... Um, uh, across Canada is to try and persuade coroners to have um, some easy way of searching and, and recording um, occupation and first respond occupation uh, in records because I have no idea what the accurate number is of people who died by suicide in Ontario who are first responders. Um, there's no way of finding that out um, apart from what we're doing at the moment, which is essentially trying to ask everybody. So people do know that suicide deaths in Ontario between beginning of 2014 and the end of 2018, please do get in contact with me. It's confidential, it's ethically approved. The list is never going to be published. We just need the name so we can access the coroner's record. Okay. And, and Simon, uh, just to speak to the second part there, how do you think once you have the information, it could be used to, to prevent suicides in public safety personnel? Well, um, one of the... Um, most successful ways of avoiding, of, of lowering suicide rate is by restricting access to means. And if uh, firearms are you know, the, the predominant cause, cause of death of first responders' suicides, then um, having protocols among uh, police that you leave your gun at home, at, at work, for instance, might, which is not consistent across police forces, some do, some don't, might be one of the interventions you might want to think about. And of course, there's, there's all the other stuff about um, getting accessible and acceptable um, mental health care for uh, first responders, which is another project we're working on. Okay, perfect, thank you for that. All right, Rose, last question for you. 
uh, unless we get more, <laughs> is um, you mentioned how uh, the patterns of mental health are different between those that have served a long time and, and the recruits that you're seeing. Are you hoping with this longitudinal study to perhaps be able to see when or how people might develop illness? It, exactly. We want to see the impacts of the occupation on a person's well-being. Um, if, when we look at persons with tenured, um, with occupational tenure, and we see that they're screening positive for mental illnesses and you know, suicide ideation at these really high rates that, um, you know, no one's employment should leave them unwell. And if we want to improve the well-being, we need to recognize what it is about the job um, that, that is having the strongest impact. And I, I think it's naive and um, and, and inaccurate to say it's it's working with prisoners. That that's not the case. The stressors are much more complex than that. And you know, um, there's there's a lot of good people in corrections, and there's there's a lot um, that can be done to to make them their well-being to to improve their well-being. So I am just going to wrap it up then because I don't see any more questions that have come in. Uh, so first of all, thank you. Oh, sorry, Simon. Hey, yeah, I, I just thought the supplementary answer to, my, to, that, to that question. The other thing in terms of preventing suicides is that it seems, even from the limited data that we've got, that first responders, especially police, who are being disciplined, are really high risk. Uh, they, they, that, that's the that's the life event stuff that comes out, and so finding better organisational processes for managing disciplinary issues. I think it would be one of the ways in this in this particular population which might help to prevent suicides. Okay, that makes sense. I have to agree with Simon. I think that would actually translate over to the correctional officer population. Persons undergoing investigation um, really do suffer. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for those add-ons. I appreciate it. All right, so we'll wrap up then. Um, so again, thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, your your information is valuable and it's uh, great to show share this important research with everybody uh, as we reach the end of our session i want to ask you all to complete the survey that will appear after the end of the session tomorrow you'll receive an email with a video of today's session uh, on march 10th sector will be hosting a town hall titled how organizations can support psp dealing with the opioid crisis we have two prominent psp leaders talking about what their organizations are doing to support psp and the clinical psychologist will share insight from frontline personnel and talk about how to best offer uh, support for them we hope you'll join us for that session and the link will be included in the follow-up email tomorrow once again thank you to all the researchers and knowledge users that are working to improve the well-being of all psp um, this series that we've been presenting with CIHR has been really eye-opening for me. I've learned a lot. Uh, it's been a privilege to help share your work. Uh, to everyone out there, please take care and stay safe. Bye. Bye.